Thank you, Blake. We uh, Everyone enjoy our bantering this morning, some good ideas. I'm looking forward to Turnaround Tuesday. But right now we're fortunate to have Callum Thomas with us. And he's a, t a, a top elite type technician. Uh, he has a website called Top Down Charts. And Callum, I'm making you the presenter. So looking forward to hearing your voice and seeing your screen and yep. getting some views of what's on your radar screen, buddy. All right, uh, can you hear me? I can, Callum, uh, nice to meet you. All right, great. So I'm in New Zealand and it is 1 yeah. a.m. here. Yeah, really. I, I, how many I mean, energy drinks? I about sleep before this, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm already beginning. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many energy drinks did you have today? Uh, well, if you, if you read my Twitter feed, you would have seen that I have failed to make um, my morning coffee today, but um, yeah. anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, before we get to your uh, what you want to show, the PMI, and uh, I've been to the site. It's excellent. It's mm -hmm. a real nice site for intelligence gathering. How did you get into the business? Can you tell us a little bit about the beginning yeah. of your journey, uh, who influenced you, and how did you get from there to here? Yeah, so, I mean, I started this company about almost a year ago now. And um, before that, I was in um, on the buy side, so at a pretty large pension company in Australia and New Zealand. So I worked in both the Australia and the New Zealand offices. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd worked there for about eight years. and across uh, quite a range of roles there, but mostly investment strategy economics. And you know, it's, uh, it's quite a different ball game when you're in that kind of zone versus um, not necessarily the, you know, doing it on your own. Um, you know, and, I mean, the, the kind of stuff that I did there and, and certainly the way that I frame my research or the, the audience of my research is sort of more the, I guess, um, what is pension fund managers, family offices, people are generally looking, you know, over six, six to 12, six to 12 month um, horizon kind of thing. Yeah, and um, more institutional views. Exactly, yeah, and you know, typically they'll, they'll, they'll be managing money over a you know, longer term period and they'll set up their, um, you know, strategic benchmark and they'll be tilting around that. And so, um, you know, fitting in um, things like, you know, what's going on with Japanese equities, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that they're quite interested in. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, you know, I've got a, got a small base of clients so far and steadily building on that. And, you know, as, as the client list grows, you actually learn a lot from what they're focusing on because you obviously get questions from them. Um, alongside the stuff that, that you provide, and um, I think that you've got my screen. Have you got my screen on there? I do. We're looking at your top-down chart screen right now with the PMI yeah. margins being number one. Yep. So this is the weekly report that I put out, and uh, I thought that it's probably, unless you had any, you know, questions or if you wanted me to go anywhere in particular, um, we can probably have a look at this. Okay. Well, uh, I'm I'm following you here. So let, let's just carry on with what you plan to talk to us about. Yeah, and um, oh, just for you know, how long do we have here? Don't worry, I, I'll interrupt you. Yeah, I have right. a reputation for being the interrupter. So um, yep. till about uh, 20, we have about 20 minutes, Callum. Okay, good. And yeah, uh, please do um, interrupt me with questions, especially if I, um, if I get too far ahead of myself. Okay. All right, so this first one, um, we'll always start, with, always start with the bottom line, um, the top down. So for this one, um, my overall message here was that the global PMI data are consistent with the positive growth inflation outlook. And, you know, it's about the underlying data and trends that support that whole reflation thing. So I don't know if you um, yes. about to play with that one, but it's certainly... Um, it's one that okay. sort of, it's almost it coming down. It unwound for a while. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and, and now you think it's back in gear, 
you know, with uh, mainly like a lot of industrial commodities uh, have mm -hmm. really been performing quite well, copper being the benchmark, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, this is probably, this chart here is probably the one that kind of tracks the whole thing. So the red line there is what I call the reflation or risk on speculative futures positioning indicators. So that tracks um, the, their CEO, of the CFTC's um, Commitment of Traders report, okay. the future positioning. So and I've combined it across equities, commodities, and bonds. Bonds are in there inverted. So, you know, um, you know, it's it's to, it's designed to be consistent, right? Um, and, you know, we saw it, it's really a phenomenal run up in um, positioning. You know, everyone bought into that whole um, reflation trade. And then you know, if you look at it now, it's, been completely unwound. Um, so I think that that there is probably a very significant thing to um, to have on the radar. And the, the blue line there is is a similar measure across it's, it's across the same three groups of assets, but it's looking at 200 day moving average breadth. Um, you know, which is quite a you know well used indicator in the stock market. But then I've applied it to commodities and bonds as well, and you can see that it's that it's kind of moving in in line there, but you know this big reset has happened there, and I think you know it's important to keep these kind of indicators in mind because this is what's sort of, you know you're using data. This, this, this is what drives the narrative, correct? Well, well, you're using the data to measure what people are thinking, and um, I guess the price line there, um, effectively a price line, um, is is what's been of shifting people's uh, attention in the short term. But then, you know, you look at that chart to the right there, and this is what I call um, the deflator meter. I like to make a lot of sort of unique, innovative charts here, and um, this is one of them. It uh, looks across as many different countries as I have the data for, and so for, and it, and it measures what proportion are seeing deflation. So that red line there, that's yeah. for CPI. So we we had at that 2015 period there, like that was when we had that bond market, you know, bonds yeah. um, going to the record lows at that at that stage. You know, if you probably remember. And um, so we, we probably one the one that stands out for me on this one. They they're all consistent, but you know, forward earnings that fell off the cliff. Well, 70 percent of because because this is measuring countries that are in deflation that are seeing negative year on year growth rates, right? So at that time in you know late twenty sixteen, seventy percent of countries, you know, the majority of countries were seeing actual, you know, downgrades or declines in their forward earnings. And um, you know, throughout this whole post crisis period, it's been this um, you know, even if you set aside the price inflation aspect, you look at the economic you know, aspect. It's been economic deflation throughout that period, where you know, almost half of um, countries across that period, like at least forty percent, were seeing negative or declining, contracting industrial production, and then all of a sudden that's turned around. So I guess the you know, you compare and contrast to that two thousand and five to two thousand and seven period, where virtually no one was seeing deflation at that time, and now we've kind of returned to that. Well, the what well, the market implications for what you're seeing here? Well, you know, anything that's well, it, it kind of comes back to whether this here, you know, lurch away from deflation persists. And my view is that it does. You know, so if we look at the PMIs here, it's basically indicating pretty good. Manufacturing conditions. Um, you know, we've seen a turn up there in the US and China, which have been traveling pretty closely together lately, which um, I think is a key. Do you consider uh, these uh, a leading or coincident lagging indicators? Or are these projecting, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, kind of like in hockey, Kel? You yeah. know, is this where the puck is, or is this where the puck's going to be? I think these are where the puck is. Okay. 
Um, I mean, for the most part, it de- it kind of depends, but like this is probably the best uh, real time indicator that you can get into um, where the economy is tracking. Certain parts of it, like this this here one, the global trade one, but that red line combines the trade indicators, and that has about a four to six month lead. Um, which is still pointing to an ongoing rebound in global trade, um, and that was that was probably one of the big calls that I had last year. That big one. You think any protectionist moves are? Uh, does any of this will it change dramatic, uh, dramatically if there's any kind of trade war, say between uh, you know tariffs and so forth happening between China and the U.S. or anywhere else? Russia yeah. sanctions. Uh, yeah, it play a role here. It definitely would. Um, but you know, I think it would. It, it were it to be actually implemented, which is something that's you know yet to happen. Um, it would show up in these numbers. Okay. And, you know, I think um, I, I showed a chart actually. I'll see if I can figure it out in the latest weekly chart storm that I do on Twitter. Um, and it shows that this big drop off in interest around uh, Trump's policies, right? So this one here, the mentions of Trump policy in the earnings calls. And so the latest one, the Q2 earnings calls, the, the blue line there, and for me that represents a whole, uh, you know, We've, we've, we've kind of given up on that whole idea now that, that he's going to even do anything positive or negative, uh, you know, which is one way to interpret that chart. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I always say that you, you have to try and see things as they are, not as you want to see them. And, um, you know, for now, global trade is actually going fairly well. I mean, so would, would you favor? Uh, yeah, uh, what what markets would you favor? A lot of people have been, uh, mm-hmm. you know, much more bullish emerging markets in Europe over the U.S. Uh, some yep. people would say, uh, you know, that was kind of a Jeff Gunlich type of trade. Uh, mm-hmm. What are the areas of the world that you're investing in now? Yeah, so probably yeah, emerging markets is definitely high on the radar. Uh, that, I mean, valuation reasons alone are fairly compelling there. And when you see global trade improving like that, and China um, you know, making this tentative rebound there, emerging markets are uh, going to be the ones that are going to benefit from that. And um, probably worth just jumping into a little bit of unusual analysis that I did here. So, I direct your attention to the equity multiplier chart, which is the one on the bottom right here. That red line there is tracking leverage in emerging markets. So it's gone up a lot. <laughs> it's gone up to um, develop market standards, really. And one implication of that is that you only need to see a small improvement in profitability, you know, headline profitability, profit margin. To, to, to flow through into a higher return on equity. And from an equity investor's perspective, that's, you know, it's the number one thing that they're concerned about, right? And, um, you know, you can see that synchronized upturn in return on equity across the major equity markets there that um, really is mirroring what we're seeing um, at a global economic level. So uh, basically, yeah. all your work is saying uh, uh, all uh, you know green lights, you know full speed ahead. Um, global yeah. bull markets should continue until things change. Yeah, and I mean, but it's the global growth outlook that that gives me comfort. It's these charts, these kind of charts here, uh, and probably the other one that. I look at perhaps more than others is this here one, property prices. Yeah, so, they've been exploding everywhere. 
Exactly, and um, well, we, we kind of should expect it, right? Um, given what's going on in monetary policy, um, you know, yeah, the Fed's heading to the exits, um, but even even then, it's it's a slow exit, and everyone else has got it going on full blast. You look at this chart here, maybe less so to Japan, but the rest of them, this is basically the world's major economies. All of them are seeing year on year gains in property prices. It's been a while since we've actually seen everyone in this uh, positive zone. You know, the last time we saw that was really uh, pre crisis, and ever, ever since we had the crisis, it's been, you know, China was going full blast, but the rest of them were sort of still not quite caught up. And, and property prices are so key because they influence consumer confidence, um, banks' asset quality, banks' willingness to lend, ability to lend. Um, and, you know, when things go to crap on this front, it just precipitates all the risks, you know, for China. Um, you know, I watch China's market particularly closely. For, for any Australian-based investor, you know, you actually probably look at China close, more closely than you do America because, um, you know, China has that big impact on commodities. And, you know, for Australia, um, <laughs> that also has a um, big impact on house prices. You know, I think they're in a similar situation to Canada. So so do interest rates. So um, uh, what's your view on global bond markets? And there are some signs I'm seeing in the U.S. Treasury market that says, you know, we could head up towards that 3% yield. Would that put a dent in the real estate bubble or acceleration that you're seeing now? Is, is that the pin that pops the real estate bubble? Yes, um, would be the short answer. Um, That's I like short answers. Yeah, well, like <laughs> you could just say yes, no. And <laughs> the, the thing is, like you, you look at this. Um, I'm talking about Australia. Probably not many people are that interested in Australia, but you know they've had a massive housing market boom. Some would say bubble. In and Canada? it's very similar to what's going on in Canada. Um, actually, you know very similar to what's going on in Canada in terms of um, how they've had a you know, yeah. very buoyant housing market there. And the same thing in New Zealand, actually. Um, and I actually did a piece on it. It's called, called them the Cairns Economies. You know, they've, they've all got overvalued housing markets. And how do you see a, um, a housing market, you know, boom or bubble, if you want to call it, like that resolve um, or, you know, get unwind? It's, yeah, higher interest rates, higher unemployment, um, but those are pretty much the, the, the key culprits. So, but even then, you know, you, you need a big jump in interest rates to, to really donk it on the head. But the what, do you year, think um, would, what do you think it would take? 4% tenure? Doubling of rates here? Yeah, that would definitely cause some issues. Yeah. <laughs> um, 4% on the, on the bond, on the 10 year, um, if it, well, you know, it's always a matter of um, there's, there's always two dimensions, right? There's time yeah, and it um, looks like if it gets through two five two different. six, it looks like if it gets through two five two six, mm. three is the next uh, next stop. Uh, no yeah, problem. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think three three kind of seems quite reasonable to me. I mean, given yeah, historically, given the global, yeah. Well, given what I'm seeing in the global um, inflation growth dynamics, I mean. It just seems quite natural that we should get there. Um, and I think I've pulled up an Excel chart here. It's my US Treasury sentiment index, and it's already turned around from extreme bullish levels. So uh, if that one go, keeps on going. That's, a, that's That's been a good indicator in the past. OK, thank you. But uh, oh, since, we're on the, since we've got this chart up here, um, bond volatility. You want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, um, so bond volatility is zero, zero. Yeah, it's, it's, huh? it's yeah. Is that it's, a real it's, number? It's, it's, there is, it's non-existent. <laughs> well, it's just like the VIX, right? It's gone down yeah. to um, really so, low levels. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I think that this chart here is a, is a great one because you know, it got to this. It got to very similar levels 
just before we got the taper. This is, this is about when we got that taper tantrum. Uh, um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, we're heading into um, September, which, you know, I think September is a pretty good, pretty good um, opportunity to get QT underway. We're, um, you know, passive quantitative tightening. Okay, where they're uh, uh, they're starting to trim their balance sheet. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, uh, I think you know it's pretty much the they have to now. they have to tell all their their buddies at Jackson Hole first before they do it. That's right. Yeah. Right? You know, they get together, do a shot of tequila, and go. Okay, guys, yeah. we're going to start tr <laughs> trimming our balance <laughs> sheet, and it's it's a pretty big one. So yeah. support us, so it's a smooth ride. So exactly. Yeah. Well, Callum, I, I appreciate you staying up so late, brother, and uh, you're invited to join our community. And uh, I know that people could follow you. Your Twitter handle is at Callum underscore Thomas, and yep. and your service is at Top Down Charts. And yep. very interesting, fundamental, a technical way to look at fundamentals, which exactly. uh, I found very interesting and. I wish you uh, success uh, being away from the institutions. I'm glad they let you out, and <laughs> we were able <laughs> and we were able to have this interview, buddy. Great, good to talk. All right, so thanks very much. I'll tweet the interview and I'll drop it in your uh, in your box in Twitter, and uh, maybe we could get together later on in the year and see what your yeah. stuff is saying at that time. Yeah, exactly. It Thank you, Phil. All right. Thank you, Callum. You're you're now my trading warrior brother. Everyone thank sure. Callum Thomas and follow him and keep an eye, as Blake Morrow says, fundamentals are at least half the picture. So here's a, a nice way for you guys to look at it. Uh, I'm wrapping it a little early today, guys. I'll see everyone tomorrow for turnaround Tuesday. Good hunting the rest of the day. I still I still like selling rallies in Euro. Stops above last week's high, looking for a pullback. I think 115 is a natural place for it to end up over the course of the next week, few weeks, but I do believe we'll take out the highs that we posted last week as well. Good hunting. Don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Thanks again, Callum.